Everything was just free flow, and we're still trying to figure that out. We've been so used to a set or calling of plays, and now we're getting that freedom. I think that's going to take some time, but once we get it, we could easily be a 115-point team a night. You are locked on Fantasy Basketball, your daily podcast on fantasy basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Fantrax and Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and as always you can find me on Twitter at RedRock underscore B-Ball. We're back for the last of the Positional Tiers podcast. Today's one, we're obviously going to be doing the Center Tiers because that's the only position that we haven't done just yet. So to, to discuss everything regarding the centers in the league for your upcoming fantasy basketball drafts, I'm joined by Matt Smith. Matt, how are you? I'm good, man. What's been going on? No, not not a huge amount. Just uh, just a quiet week here. You? Um, yeah, similar. Just enjoying some of these preseason games. Not that I've had a chance to watch much basketball, but it's been nice to check out some box scores and yeah, Kevin Durant with another good performance again today. And Yusuf Nurkic has been looking solid. And yeah, um, unfortunately, a few little injuries. Gary Harris um, out for four to six weeks. So that's a bit of a shame. I know you're a big Gaz fan. I'm a big, I am a big Gaz fan. We, we talked. To, I talked about this with Kyle yesterday. Gaz out. Reggie Jackson's out. Ben Simmons is out, obviously a, as well. So an, a number of guys who are who are out, unfortunately, to, to begin the season. It's never a good, never a good thing. Matt, one thing I do need to mention is Fantrax has got some cash leagues that they're starting at the moment. Uh, at the moment, I think they've just, they're just points leagues, but they are running some head-to-head and roto ones as well. So if you're looking for some nice cash or, or pro leagues, however you want to frame it or phrase it, Fantrax has got those rolling out at the moment. So go and uh, go and check those out. And one other thing, Matt, if you some people you know look for ways that they can help support uh, this podcast. And, and what I decided to do today, I don't even know why I decided to do it, to be honest, but I decided to design a t-shirt. Now, if you want to check this t-shirt out, you go to teespring.com slash RRFB uh, and check it out. There's a t-shirt, there's a hoodie, I think there's a there's two different types of, of t-shirts, some different colors. But I, I put it out today on, on Twitter and someone said, oh, yeah, it's it's too obscure. It doesn't you know, say what it's from. I did that deliberately. I didn't want to put T-shirts out there with big you know, locked on logos or look at me. Oh, I listen to fantasy basketball podcasts. It's literally a T-shirt. And, and on the front of it, it has this. Let's get to it. To it. In a logo. And that's it. it. It could mean anything. I think it looks all right. But if you if you want to if you want to support the podcast and get a T-shirt, which I think looks OK, and, and it's not necessarily tied to, um, yeah your love of fantasy basketball that's a way you can do it as well if you hate them whatever let me know but uh it's just something i decided to to look at today so matt when you're gonna ch- you get a chance if you're looking for a new t-shirt you can go across there and have get yourself a let's get to a t-shirt just branch, branching out to a bit of merchandise now yeah just just you know what i saw it i don't even know where i saw it uh, i saw it somewhere and thought oh, let, let me have a look i know i'd heard of teespring before so i had a look at their, their stuff and thought okay this is pretty straightforward made up this little logo, popped it on a t-shirt, there we go, done. Um, and see, look, I might not sell any of them, but it's just some, it was it was actually fun to do. It was fun to design them, and maybe there's more stuff coming down the uh, down the path that is, again, it's not, not podcast-related necessarily. It's not, it doesn't have, you know, emblazoned with website addresses or, or, or crap like that or anything like that. It's just literally a, an orange logo that says, let's get to it, and it's on multiple colored t-shirts. That is uh, that is all there is. So enough me talking about t-shirts, Matt. Let's actually let's get to it. To it. Let's talk centers. Let's talk center tiers. And uh, everyone should have listened already to the other four: the point guard, shooting guard, small forward, power forward tiers. But if they haven't, if they're just jumping in now, this is the first positional tier podcast they've listened to, Matt. What is it? Yeah. So basically, what um, I've been trying to do is group players of like value. Um, based on our projections at Basketball Monster, 8-cat, standard league sort of value. So, um, yeah, like I said, it's it's grouping these players. So we often know that, you know, Rubio is good with his assistance deals and weaker in other areas. And um, who did I even have him tiered with? I've got it here. Um, someone like Kurt Kyrie Irving has strong points and threes and efficiencies. So completely different, but in terms of their overall value, um, yeah, from from our projections, they're similar value, which puts them in in the same tier. So um, it's also good to get an overall picture of um, where these guys are grouped in terms of their positions um, 
when you're drafting so you know if there's a lot of point guards early which there are you'll need to get one early and there's a lot of good shooting guards late um power forwards and centers are top heavy as well so you're going to need to get one you're probably in the top 30 40 um yeah whereas your wings you can you can get later in draft so it's just a good way to see yeah where the value is throughout a draft as well when you hear this podcast and you we go through these players you, you might say, where's Carl Anthony Towns? Where's Anthony Davis? Like, these guys were included in the Power Forward tier podcast. Um, but So we're going through the rest of the play. So across the, all five podcasts, you'll hear all players who are you know, considered top 150 type guys who are going to be looking at in, in your standard sort of league. So you can go back through those other ones and listen to that. But we haven't forgotten to put Towns in. We haven't forgotten to put Davis in. We've got them classified in, in the Power Forward tiers at this point. Tier one, Maddie, it's a, it's a lonely tier. Who occupies it? It is uh, Hassan Whiteside on his own there. Um, massive season last year. Gave owners a bigger advantage in blocks than Steph Curry did in threes, which is incredible to think. And small chance he could even improve on that again this season. Obviously, Chris Bosh, uh, massive doubts over his availability this season. Um, his preseason has been massive again. He had 20 and 13, I think, off the top of my head the other day. Something, or something huge, similar. yeah. Um, and... Just in, just insane. So he should be, yeah, comfortably inside the top twelve, and probably shouldn't fall out of the top ten in most formats. He had twenty and thirteen with three blocks in twenty three minutes in his first game. Now, what, what's our take on his free throws? Because he was a punt only guy to start off last season, but he you know, was seventy plus percent down the stretch, and it looked like his change in his form had, had you know, made him be a guy. We've projected him for seventy percent this season, yeah. so. That doesn't rule him out of, of builds that aren't punt free throw, does it? No, it doesn't. So we've got him on 6.2 attempts, which just puts him below average, um, minus 0.86. So, yeah, you can you can recover from that. So especially I've seen a lot of people um, pairing him with guys like Paul George or Damien Lillard even. Um, so you're counteracting the field goal um, percentage from the high and the low and then counteracting that free throw percentage as well. Um, and obviously Paul George and Damon Lillard, high volume scorers, Lillard, well both of them with three points as well. So um, I like that strategy of, of going big and small and, and there's a, a really good example. That, um, yeah, sort of towards the towards the end of the first and early second. Yeah, that's where Whiteside fits in yeah, with, with Chris Paul, with Lillard, with George, with these sort of guys, get those assists from those other guys, get the huge blocks, big rebounds, big field goal percentage. Now he did go just two of five from the free throw line in his first preseason game, but you can't judge anything off one preseason. If we're going to do that, we'll think that Rudy Gobert is going to go 13 or 14 um, in every game that he plays, which he did in the last preseason game. And that's something we'll talk about a little bit later with Gobert. But there is, there's definitely some risk there with, with Whiteside because he did do it for a two-month stretch, but he was consistent basically every night, just 75, 80% almost from the free throw line. And it makes you think that something definitely... It wasn't a two-week thing. It wasn't a one-week thing. It was like a two-month thing where there was a definite change in what he did. There was a definite visual change. And, and it worked. And there's no reason to think that he can't at least get to 70%. Maybe he doesn't. And that could be a concern. So if you're a little bit worried there and your free throw percentage is not the strongest, you think that maybe he goes to 65. Maybe he drops it a little bit. So you know, take that into consideration as well. But he's going to play a significant role this year. I think he gets more than the 29 minutes he, he saw last year. He'll start. He should play 30 plus. He'll score a fair bit. He scored a lot down the stretch with Bosch out last season. Rebounds, you know, white side. And and he can fall in some drafts he falls to like the end of the second round which is just crazy to me he he shouldn't be falling that low in my opinion he's not a guy that's getting 12 points a game he'll be getting 16 17 18 points a game which is you know not far off from what chris paul's getting and you add in his other numbers he's he's right up there what about uh tier two matt yeah it's a pretty big drop off between tier one and tier two so we go down to nikola Jokic and brook lopez um obviously nikola Jokic has been um, massively hyped this off season, not just by yourself, but by a lot of other um, fantasy in, inverted commas experts. Um, but his per minute production is is just insane. Um, does a little bit of everything. No weakness. Efficiency is elite. Um, just like Brook Lopez with the scoring and blocks as well. We know his rebounding rate is a little bit below where we might otherwise like it. But yeah, those two guys are really solid picks. Probably sort of getting towards the end of second, um, early to mid-third round. 
I want to talk about Jokic for a bit here because you see, if you go into Basketball Monster and look at the projections and have turnovers turned on, he comes out as the 16th best player, which you never, 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 never want to pick him. Never. You, you, at pick 16. you should have that on a t shirt. Never, 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 never. Never. Never pick him at pick 16. It is just, it's foolish. Again, I, w- I would never draft with turnovers on because it skews things so dramatically in terms of their value. It, it it's one category which, again, you get the best result from having nobody out there. So you could have an, an empty spot, and that's your best result in that category. So it just skews everything so much. Now, you turn it off, and he goes down to 26, and even that, I think, is high. Yeah, if everything works out and he gets the 29 minutes that we think he did and he didn't doesn't have a sophomore slump and he, and he continues to progress, which is all things that you'd have to say with 75% probability is going to happen, and he could get more than that. He could play 30 minutes. He could play 31 minutes because he is that good. But he's not a, a rock-solid this is absolutely going to happen, guy. I've grabbed him in drafts you know, at around 40-ish in some situations. His Yahoo rank has gone from like 110 to 30, I think, I, I believe it is, something really high. And it, it means that in a lot of cases, you just shouldn't be drafting him. Um, it, it, I've talked about it lots of times as well. The, the draft track or the projections, it's not a list. It's not, let's go down. Jokic is the top guy. Let's grab him. There's lots of things that you can take into consideration now. Now, all probabilities are, Matt, that, that he does return that sort of value, that he does you know, look really good and, and you know, build on a, a historic rookie season, which he had last year. But it's not set in stone. There's things that can change. If he plays more forward, does his rebounding rate drop? Does his field goal percentage drop? Does his block rate drop? And we saw that in the first preseason game playing next to Nurkic. We don't know how Michael Malone's going to run that rotation. One thing I am sure of is that Kenneth Reed's no good. But we don't know how that rotation's going to run or how that position is going to run. So I just needed to, again, I feel like I've said this a million times over the over the offseason, but you know, the, the a bunch of new people have started listening in the last week to this podcast. Jokic... Love him, love him, love him, love him. Loved him in the 40s with upside to get into the you know, top 15. But picking him in the second round or looking at that nine cat rank and taking him in the top 20, it's just going to end in tears for you. So yep. not not happening. Yeah, I, I also got a feeling that Jokic might have a slow, slower start to the season. Maybe he might only plays 26 to 28 minutes while Gallinari and Chandler are back and Fareed's in the mix. And come the end of the season, once... I'm, I'm expecting the Nuggets to fall out of the playoff race and maybe Gallinari's dealing with some injuries and, you know, they're putting Chandler aside and Fareed may or may not be traded and Jokic just then gets 32 to 34 minutes and might be one of these after all-star break guys who goes absolutely nuts and puts up that top 20 value we're expecting. So I kind of see Jokic as maybe like a really good um, buy-low guy yep. come, you know, maybe even December. Um, early January if he doesn't get the minutes early and owners start getting frustrated because he's putting up as you said they've spent you know draft pick number 30 on him and he's putting up top 45 value so yeah I think if you do draft him you're just going to maybe have to be a little bit patient over the first say say, six or eight weeks of the season I think that's uh, exactly right Matt I think there is that concern now you talk about them not getting the playoffs if you look at the ESPN RPM projections they're going to project it at 40 wins so they think they're going to be right in the mix which um, is it's quite high, but they did have Portland projected pretty high last season, so let's see how that works out. But they've got them pretty high, so we'll see how it all happens with them. Now, Lopez, you touched on already. I love Brook Lopez. I have minute concerns about his foot. Very, very minimal. In fact, it doesn't really stop me drafting him anywhere. It might mean that you can get him 10 spots later than what his actual value is. Elite score, a really good shot blocker, great percentages, much better rebound than what he's been in the past. I really like Lopez, and he's a great rotisserie center, isn't he? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, maybe there is a slight concern around his availability come the end of the season there yep. in Brooklyn, whether he does play. But yeah, in terms of rotisserie, getting sort of 70 to 75 games out of him with those elite percentages, um, yeah, in in round three, that's that's awesome value. What about uh, tier three? We've got a couple of uh, international centers here. Yeah, uh, we have Gorgi Dieng and Jonas Valanciunas. Um, now, both of these guys are just permanent monsters um gorgie deng is an interesting one to see if he can get thibodeau's trust early um and really cement his his playing time and, and minutes um and only he's a nice little stat for you josh only Dieng and kevin durant averaged at least a steal and block per game while shooting at least 50 percent from the field and 80 percent from the free throw line last season so yeah Dieng does have a really unique skill set 
and Valentinus, you and I are both big fans. No Bismack Biombo there in um, Toronto this season. So not that we were saying that Biombo was good enough to take minutes off of um, JV, but he just did enough where he was able to maybe pinch five minutes and hopefully those five minutes will now go to Valentinus and we'll see him hit over 30 minutes a game this season. Yeah, I love Valentinus. He's a guy that's a top 60 guy in 26 minutes. We've got him projected at just on 30, uh, I believe, uh, 29, so not even at 30 minutes. And if he gets 31, 32, then he, he goes further than that. He's a great rebounder. He's a much better shot blocker than what you might imagine. You look at him, and we've got him at a number of 1.7 blocks for this season. People go, he's not a shot blocker. But if you look at what he did over the last, say, three months of last season, he blocked shots at a much higher rate than that. So we've actually dropped it down a little bit. And without Biombo there, then I think we're going to have to see him be relied upon for a little bit more rim protection uh, as well. You talked about the backups, you know, Pascal Siakam, maybe he's going to play 48 minutes a night. Everyone seems to love him at the moment. You know, Jared Sullinger is another guy there. Um, Bebe Nogueira, who's another guy I like. But we hear so much coming from Masai Ujiri, Evan. You know, Valanciunas is stepping up this year. He's going to have a bigger role. And I really like him. You can get him pretty late on ESPN as well, like outside the top 60 or 70. Um, he's had one really awesome preseason game. He went 20-9 and nine in the second game in just 19 minutes. He hit eight free throws, eight out of eight. He was 50% from the field. His other two games, they weren't with that great. Three and seven in 15 minutes, six and six in 21 minutes with a couple of blocks and a steal, but getting some other stuff done as well. Um, yeah, I, I really like him. But with both these guys, Jeng and Valanciunas, there is a, a minute's risk there. Now, we they could go much higher than what we projected. We've got 31 for Jeng and 29 for Valanciunas. They could play 33 and 32 minutes each. But with Jeng, we might see Bielitsa get some of these minutes. We might see Shabazz Muhammad play the four, which you know, Thibodeau's talked about. We might see Cole Aldridge, Carl Towns as a, as a front court combination, and that might drop Jeng down. But both of these guys are steal opportunities because you'll find in a lot of spots they're available outside the top 50, aren't they, Matty? Yeah, they are. And yeah, that's exactly where you want to draft them because they both can not just return top 50 value, but as you said, with the right minutes, jump into that top 40 um, sort of range. Tier four. You've got a lot of guys in this one. Yeah, we've got a mixed bag here. So we've got Rudy Gobert, Mark Gasol, Pau Gasol, Nielens Noll, DeAndre Jordan, Andre Drummond, uh, Miles Turner, and Nikola Vucevic. So I don't know if you want to go through them all individually, but um, obviously uh, Jordan and Drummond jump up, um, depending on your format and strategy. If you're punting, obviously they become sort of tier one type players, second round type players. Um, if you're in a rotisserie league, they basically become undraftable. Uh, Miles Turner, we both love, massive breakout candidate this season. I want 100% shares on Miles Turner. Um, the problem with Miles Turner, though, is he, he's like Jokic. His ADP or his rank numbers yeah. have jumped from 110 to 30 something, and it's almost taking away his value. Yeah, that's right. If, you, if you're spending a top 40 pick on him, then yeah, you're getting dollar for dollar value. You're not getting that massive return on investment um, as you might have been if you drafted maybe three or four weeks ago, but that's the pros and cons of drafting early and late. Yep. What about um, uh, what about the Gasols? What's your, what's your take on both of those guys, Mark and Powell? Um, I do have concerns around both of them. Uh, Mark Gasol, we've already heard, he's got those lingering foot issues. Um, David Fisdale has already said that he'll sit some games, so probably more suited to, to you know formats with games limits, like, like your rotisserie leagues. Um, I have issues with like these guys in weekly leagues because if you if you um, yep. lock in them in for a four game week and then all of a sudden that turns into a two game week that is really going to hurt you where you miss out on a couple of games um, and the same with Pau Gasol like maybe down the stretch when his uh, minutes are limited maybe a few DMPs there just to rest him and get him through to playoffs so it's really going to be a case of how far they fall I don't think I want to spend a top 50 pick on either of them like I take Miles Turner over both of them any day yeah I agree um, but if they start falling into the 60 70 range then yeah then I don't think you have any any choice but to take them at that point go back and listen I'm not telling you Matt I'm telling the listeners go back and listen to the Memphis Grizzlies season preview I did with Peter Edmiston from the commercial appeal in Memphis we talked about Gasol uh, at length um, he's going to be 32 in January I think he's I think his birthday is the same day as mine he's, he's going to be 32 in January he is coming off a broken foot. He's a hefty man. He's seven foot plus. And his numbers last season, before he got injured, were the worst in his career. His numbers looked bad. The eye test on what he was doing looked bad. He was out of position defensively. He, he couldn't get rebounds. He just seemed way off last year. And that's before he got hurt. So 
not only I would have had concerns with him coming into this season based on just what he'd done last season alone, let alone the fact that the dude broke his foot and has just sort of started running in the last four weeks now. That's my concern with him. So he's probably not going to find his way onto any of my teams. Pau Gasol, I have the same concerns with you. What do you make of Gobert's free throw shooting? Well, it looked good the other day. It did but, look good. Uh, um, I would I'd take Gobert over over the Gasols. Yep. Um, I do like those bigger numbers in the rebounding and blocks category. The free throw percentage, I would, even in a rotisserie league, I think you can still, there's just enough there to work with. Um, like especially if you're getting a, a Harden or a Durant early and then you know you you maybe get some wings or another point guard early and then you really need to look for boards and blocks. I think Gobert is a great um, pick in that in that sort of scenario. So um, I think it's it's just where we want it to be. If he starts going into the, the five and six attempts at sixty five to sixty eight percent, then it becomes a real issue. That that's that's right. If he if he gets to six attempts and, and keeps it at sixty percent, it, it is a concern. Now, he, yeah, he was great. Thirteen of fourteen is great. But we also saw him last season, and this led to a lot of his preseason hype in EuroBasket. Oh, he's a he's a much better free throw shooter. He's a, he's shooting seventy five percent here. This is going to come into the season, and he's going to be this top fifteen player. And he was really bad. And he, he he wasn't really bad, but he dropped off significantly in his shooting. And after the All-Star break, he hit just 51% of his free throws on five attempts a game, which which is unwinnable almost in that category then. So there is some concern. So we talk about maybe Whiteside regressing. Can Gobert go the other way and increase his free throws? It's looking positive at this point, but when I'm drafting, I'm not coming in and going... You know what? There was one preseason game in October where he went 13 of 14 against Phoenix. I think his problems are solved. I want to see it over this entire preseason. And if he's shooting at 70% there, then then you know what I'll do. I'll go, you know what? That's pretty good. And vice versa, I see Whiteside going at 50% the entire preseason. I'll go, you know what? I'm a little bit shit scared of this now. But based on one game, I'm not looking at it and going, well, he, he's just going to he's gonna get to the line more than everybody in the entire league. And he's going to hit every shot. You know, I, I saw some things mentioned about, oh, yeah, Gobert looks great. Oh, in his first game, he, he was four of four until he missed his next three. Well, that still means he was four from seven, and that's still 50%. So that's, I know it's not exactly 50%, but it's still not great. So don't don't overreact too much to one game, but it's definitely something to watch. And if that arrow keeps pointing up, then his arrow keeps pointing up, and he starts becoming maybe a guy you look at it in the 40s, maybe in the mid-30s as well, I, I would say. Yeah. Sure. What do you make of Nerland Noel? Um, yeah, he is a really tricky one to get a handle on his value like that crowded front court in Philly really really scares me um, it appears he's lost the starting job at this point yeah it does and I think that's even worse for his value like but if he gets traded and a team can give him 28 30 minutes and those defensive goes uh, numbers go back and he's nearly at two blocks and two steals per game then like that's incredible like he could be a guy who almost wins you a league if he gets traded like it's a massive if so once again it's probably going to depend where he goes like I don't once again probably don't feel quite comfortable spending a top 50 pick on him but if he goes late 50s early 60s um, maybe the risk is worth it if you've got some some guys up the top who you can rely on like your Hardens and Westbrooks and and Curries and these sort of guys so a little bit depends on, on roster build but yeah, that's that's a real tricky one right now. We've got him projected at 27 minutes a night, and that brings him to be the 53rd ranked player. So you're looking at that and going, well, there's great upside if he gets more than that. Now, does you know, he won't get 27 minutes every night because there'll be nights when Embiid plays and plays 21 minutes that Noel might get 24 minutes. But then there'll be nights when he's when Embiid is out and Noel starts and plays 30 minutes. And that should hopefully... Um, average out to around that 27. Now, it could be lower. There's also some weird stuff happening with him not wanting to be in Philly. This groin injury that kept him out of today's preseason game where um, he, uh, he he let the team know after the game, oh, by the way, I've strained my groin. It wasn't something that necessarily happened and they had to get tre- treated. So there's some, some weird stuff happening with Noel as well, and that's pushing him a fair bit down, despite the fact that, as you said, he can go two steals a game. He can go two blocks a game. And if he gets traded, he is an elite defensive player. If he gets 30 minutes a game, you're talking about a player who's top 25 in overall value. So it's a little bit of a of a sort of knife edge as to which way you want to go with uh, with grabbing Nerlens Noel. The last guy in this tier, Nick Vucevic, 
similar to all these guys, what 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 do we make of it? Like, is he going to start? Is he going to play 31 minutes, 32 minutes? Is he going to play 28 minutes? We've got him at 29 at the moment with Bismarck, Biombo, and Serge Barker there, but we haven't seen a Barker in preseason. They've been starting Biombo and Vucevic, and Vucevic has still looked pretty good, and he will look good even in 28, 29 minutes. But the difference between ranked 30th and ranked 60th is 29 versus 32 minutes. And that's the difference with Vucevic. So he'll slide. And, and Matt, I believe he slid to like the 80s or 90s in a draft that we were doing at one point. And that's that's awesome if you can get him there. Yeah, people are, are quite scared off of Nikola Vucevic. And I think you drafted him at, yeah, let's say 70 or 80 at one point, um, which at that stage of the draft, I was looking at, right, if, if Nikola Vucevic gets to me with my next pick, I'm going to have to take him because, yeah, you're getting potentially top 50 player at, at pick 80. So... Yeah, then you have to get that return on investment. So, once again, a bit of a mixed bag here, um, and it's really going to depend on yeah team build strategy um, and how far these these guys go. But um, yeah, Miles Turner is is the clear standout um, of that tier four group for mine. Tier five, I've got some uh, some interesting players here, some veterans, some youngsters coming up. Who are who's in tier five? Tier five, we've got Stephen Adams, Andrew Bogut, and Clint Capella. Um, love Stephen Adams. Want lots and lots of shares in him I think he's going to be in for a massive season um, rebounding numbers people say he's not a big shot blocker which might be the case but sort of 1.2 to 1.5 steals uh, sorry blocks I'll take that um, awesome field goal percentage Andrew Bogut similar um, with blocks out of position assists if that's what you're looking for um, I'm not convinced about Andrew Bogut's season-long value. We know he does miss games. And Clint Capella, arguably the worst free-throw shooter in the game, went none from six the other day. And you can only own him if you're punting free-throws, Josh. Yeah, exactly. You, you can, but he, the pick-and-roll with him and Harden looks really, really dangerous. He, he's a great steals man. He's a good rebounder. He's a good um, shot blocker. He'll finish at a high percentage as well. So he is interesting in those sort of builds. Uh, Rotisserie, forget about it. Um, if you're not punting, forget about it. You just can't deal with him in that sense. Now, Bogut shoots a pretty poor free throw percentage, but he gets to the line like 0.8 times a game, so it has zero impact. So he's easily dealable with. And we talk about Bogut's injuries, and I've said this plenty of times. He's played more games than Jimmy Butler, Anthony Davis, Kawhi Leonard, Russell Westbrook, Nick Vucevic over the last three years. He only played 20 minutes a game for the Golden State last season. I think he plays more than that in Dallas. You won't have to pick him probably in this range, but he's a nice guy that, that slides down in drafts at 100, 110 perhaps. You can even draft him in that spot and get some nice blocks, good assists from a center, good rebounding, really high field goal percentage. Just don't expect points and don't expect threes, obviously, but he, he does what he does well. Um, Adams, yeah, obviously in for a big role. And again, we haven't seen what he can do this preseason yet with his ankle injury suffered over in Spain. We just haven't seen him get out in the court and play decent minutes. But he, he's obviously in a great spot to have a, a huge sort of jump forward. Um, are you worried about Nene with Clint Capella? Uh, not really. Like, Nene's another guy who, yeah, will miss games. I would have been way more concerned if Motty Yunus was in town, but he's not. Um, I still think they'll roll out some lineups with Ryan Anderson at centre and Ariza at power forward and just you know, just go super small and spread the floor and not even worry about defense at all. Um, so, yeah, no, 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 it doesn't cause me any um, issues in terms of if I, if I was owning Clint Capella, no. Okay, we're, we're looking at Capella. We're not projecting him at 30-plus minutes. We've got him at 28 minutes, and you know, he could easily average a double-double in that situation. And then if he gets more, then it's better for you. He could block a, a massive amount of shots. And as I said, a great steals guy as a big man as well. And, and Nene, we know that D'Antoni is, is loving Nene for whatever reason. Yeah, top five center in the league, apparently, according to D'Antoni, which makes me question a lot of the things that he says. But it feels like a, just a, a lot of um, a lot of preseason coach talk or coach speak. Um, so I'm not overly reading into that. Capella started the games and he's he's looked good. And Nene's looked great as well, but he is what he is. He's a 20-minute a game player, and that's really all he can do at this point in, in his career. Um, tier 7. We've got some uh, some, oh, some definite question marks. Oh, tier, let, let's do tier six first. That's, numerical order is always um, a pretty handy way to go, I reckon. That would be good if we did jump around, though. But anyway, <laughs> we'll, we'll do it in order. Tier six, Dwight Howard and Cole Aldrich. Um, Howard, he is what he is. Um, pairing with Jordan and Drummond for full effect. I think he's going to have a, a pretty good season in Atlanta. Um, and, yeah, another guy who's sort of falling to sort of anywhere between maybe 80 and 100 um, and in that in that 
sort of strategy where you're disregarding, not caring about your free throws, um, that bumps him up. And Aldridge, um, yeah, like we've got him projected for 19 minutes um, per game. His career high is 16, but especially now with the retirement of KG, Nikola Pekovic um, already ruled out for the entire season. Hopefully that will open up some time for him. And, yeah, if you're after boards and blocks, especially in a deeper league, then, yeah, seriously consider Cole Aldrich. Like we, we mentioned with, um, I can't remember which centre it was we talked about before, uh, but you don't have to draft him at this spot, Bogut. You, you don't have to draft Aldrich at this spot yep. in, in this. But this is, in, in 19 minutes, he did this consistently for the Clippers last season. He was one of their best players. Um, he's advanced stats, his plus minus, um, advanced box score plus minus, win shares were through the roof for the Clippers. Yeah, his career high was 16 minutes, but I can see, and it's been mentioned before, we, we can see, we're going to see Towns and Aldrich on the court together. So he's not just going to be the guy that gets the 12 minutes behind Towns. They will share the court some as well. Adrian Payne's terrible. Pekovic is done. Garnett's gone. So there's three guys there who aren't going to get really into the rotation. And what he provides is great field goal percentage, great free throw percentage, elite block rate, decent steals, and good rebounding. He's a last two pick maybe, last three round pick but really just helps you in those areas. I don't expect too much more, but he can help you in those in those couple of areas that we mentioned, a real sort of categorical specialist. And you might end up dropping him off the wave wide. That's why he's one of those last picks that, that you make there. Howard, yeah, he is who he is really. I think he'll be better than what he was last season. He'll take more shots and have more of a positive influence on your field goal percentage. Um, he'll be a bit more energized defensively as well. So I think we see a bit of a bounce back, but if you're not punting, then just don't worry about it. He's not for you. Now, and, now, tier seven. Just quickly for yep. Cole Aldrich as well. The Timberwolves played the most quality games of anyone in the NBA, so he's going to be a a um, really important streaming option yep. um, in in all legs. So especially if you're after those boards and blocks, and maybe a boost in field goal percentage. So he's going to be a streaming specialist. Absolutely. Now we go to tier seven. There's tier seven: uh, Jalil Okafor, uh, Marcin Gortat, Robin Lopez, and Cody Zeller. Um, I know you're a big Zeller fan. I think we've both already drafted Robin Lopez, and I think he's probably the standout of this group. Do you agree? Yes. Yeah, he's he's the number one guy out of this group to me. Um, Zeller, I was expecting a big breakout. I'm worried uh, about his knee. Now, you mentioned it to me the other day that you're worried about his knee. I, um, I was tweeting with uh, Rick Bernal from the Charlotte Observer, I think he's from today, and he's worried about the knee as well, that we might not see him to start the season. I'm not... <laughs> I'm more worried about his knee than I am about Roy Hibbert. No, Roy Hibbert's not providing much. Zella was the best defensive player on this team last season. He was their best rim protector. Yeah, Hibbert can be that best rim protector, but Zella offers a w- way more offensively. And again, we don't have him projected at huge minutes, but he could find himself in a situation where he plays 30 minutes a night. But the injury is definitely a concern, and that pushes him down to probably the last pick in the draft situation. Lopez is really solid where he is. Again, big man who provides positive contributions in both percentages. They're not, not easy to get. Gortat, why is he down so far? Um, his numbers have just steadily declined. Like we've got him projected for twelve and eight um, blocks now, around the one mark. No, ass- uh, no assist. Steals are low. Um, still really good from the field. Um, free throw percentage isn't too bad either at sixty eight percent. But yeah, he's just sort of declining. Maybe the um, arrival arrival of Ian Mahinmi. Has a little bit of an impact there as well on on Gortat's playing time, um, so yeah, I think that's probably the main reason why he's sort of slipping down a little bit further than he has been in previous seasons. Yeah, he's going to get overdrafted almost no doubt based on what he did the last couple of seasons. I don't see him playing the twenty nine point six minutes per game that he played the last couple of years because they spent sixty four million dollars to bring in Jan Mahinmi. Gortat, like a soul, is thirty two years of age. He's not an elite player, so players who aren't elite, absolute top notch guys. Once they get to that age, they they drop they drop off, and, and teams don't really stay with them as much. He he's not Dirk, so he's he's not yeah you know, guy that he's not Tim Duncan who's getting these minutes at 37, 30, 39 years of age. I know he's not that old, but he's thirty two, so stuff will start to decline. He's he's already had Randy Whitman almost refuse to give him thirty minutes a night the last two seasons. Now Scotty Brooks is a different guy, but the trend with bringing in a, an expensive center who's potentially overpaid who's three years younger 
I'm not saying that Mahinmi is going to start, but I think it's going to be closer to split minutes between the two than 30 and, and 18. I, I don't see it going that way. So that's why Gortat drops down for me. Okafor, we talked about Noel. The, the, it's compounded for him. It's, it's even worse for, for Okafor because he's the worst player. He was, I think he was the worst player by ESPN's defensive box score plus minus metric in the entire league last season, or at least for big men. Yeah, he scores pretty well. He's a good rebounder, but doesn't do enough in the other areas. And he's going to find it hard to even get more than 25 minutes on most nights, I reckon, this season. Could you see a situation where maybe they go with him over Noel? Um, potentially, but like I said before, this, this front court just, yeah, really scares me. I don't want anyone. Well, actually, probably the only one I want is Dario Saric, and that's saying something like being a rookie. Um it's just a massive timeshare. Got no idea what Brett Brown's going to do there. It's going to be matchups. It's going to be who gets hot early in the game. Who's needed for defensive purposes. So yeah, Wait. even at this point with you know 100, 120, like it just makes him so hard to, to draft. Like yeah, give me Robin Lopez over him, and I'd probably even take. Um, a couple of the guys in the next tier over Okafor if I really had to. Yeah, it's definitely one guy in this next tier I'd, I'd take uh, over him at this point. Yep. Um, in, in tier eight, let's uh, let's go through these guys. A lot of international centers, actually. We've got another three in this tier. We do. We have Alex Lynn, Yusuf Nurkic, Tristan Thompson, Joel Embiid, and Greg Munro. And I think the guy we're both talking about there is Yusuf Nurkic. Yep. Um, he looked really good. I know it's one game, it's preseason, it's small sample size and whatever, but he, he looked good playing for Bosnia as well. So he's had yeah. he's had a couple of months of starting to look good. Plus he had his rookie season of looking really good. And yeah, he was he was just destroyed by injuries last season. Yeah. Nurkic is great. Jokic is better, but Nurkic is great still. Like, and he is he's a key piece for for this team moving forward. So he's a he's definitely a guy that I look to grab around that 100 mark. You might even go earlier if you need to because he's got a block shot. He got some steals. He rebounds. He scores. He passes well. And the you. Try this again. The Jokic Nurkic passing combination between the two, it's really impressive to watch. It is. I thought you were going to keep talking there. No. <laughs> um, but what was I going to say about Nurkic? Yeah, last season, just those injuries, he came into the season and was um, really hyped up, and we thought this could be his breakout season. So unfortunately, he didn't get much court time, um, but this could be the season. Tristan Thompson, I actually really like as well. Um, the only other big men behind him are Channing Fry and Chris Anderson, um, obviously with Mozgov going. So he's a strong double-double guy. Can flirt with close to a steal and block a game. Um, so, yeah, he should be owned in, in all standard leagues. Don't um, don't worry about the fact that he's dating a Kardashian. Don't let that put you off drafting him. Um, Alex Lynn, and I have concerns over him as well. I just think he's going to get stuck behind Tyson Chandler and there's a very, very small chance that maybe even guys like Bender and Chris maybe start to, to jump him um, later on in the season. Yeah, this, I really like Lynn, but there is definite concerns there with him. Um, the other two guys you've got in this tier, Embiid, who's looked pretty good. He's looked rusty, but it's really, really tough to invest in him, especially in a daily changes, head-to-head type of league, because he's going to sit out, because he's going to have minutes limits. Um, I, I find it hard to to really consider drafting him in a lot of situations. Yep, absolutely agree with that. And Greg Munro, um, coming off the bench, his uncertainty whether he'll remain in Milwaukee for the majority of the season or the entirety of the season, um, yeah, that clouds his value as well. So, um, yeah, Nurkic and Tristan Thompson um, are the standouts in, in Tier 8. Munro is a guy that, if we knew he was playing 30 minutes, then he's a top 50 sort of player. And I've seen a few threads pop up in different spots um, talking about Munro. Why is everyone down on Munro? Why does everyone hate Munro? Um, I don't get it. He was good last season. And they look at his numbers for the season. Go, he, he averaged 29 minutes a game, but that's just not what happened. He averaged 30, and then he averaged 27 and 28 and 25 over the last three months as Kid just phased him out. And he's going to continue to do that this season. Now, in this spot, He's fine because you feel pretty confident that he's going to get at least, say, 25 minutes a night. And if he gets traded, maybe that goes up. And he will score. He is a good guy with steals as a big man. He's a decent passer. He's a good rebounder. He's a good field goal percentage guy. And you feel pretty confident of him providing that on most nights. But his ADP is around 60-ish. And at that spot, I just I don't have enough faith in him all of a sudden. The Bucks, you know, changing course and, oh, shit, you know what? 32 minutes, Greg, let's go. I, I don't see that being the case. I see it more being 25, 26 off the bench. Yeah, he'll score 14 points and get six rebounds. 
you know, on some nights but that he just doesn't do enough in the other areas. So when the, the minutes come down, it is, a, it is a little bit of a concern for him in yeah. that sort of a case. And two, two words there for you, Jason Kidd. Yep. Yeah, well, he, Kidd's going to do... He's starting Rashad Vaughan. So if that doesn't give you an idea of how little this guy um, cares about common sense in basketball and rotation sense, then I, I don't know what will. Rashad Vaughan's really bad. Tier 9. Uh, Yo, Kim Noah, Timothy Mozgov, and Kelly Olynyk. Um, I don't really know what to say about these guys. Kelly Olynyk probably going to have a delayed start to the season, still recovering from yep. injury. Um, so maybe look at someone like Amir Johnson um, to have a have a quicker start to yeah the season, especially in in head to head formats. Timothy Mozgov, any value there over in LA? You know what? I've drafted him in a couple of spots because he, he does slide a bit. I'm not expecting big numbers, but in a league that's a little bit deeper, um, 14, 16 team leagues, around that 120 mark, we're still looking for some some solidarity, some solid, consistent production. I think that you can get nice field goal percentage, decent free throw percentage, you know, over a blocker game, some pretty good rebounds, some a, a little bit of scoring. I think that he will be he's an okay guy to pick with one of your last couple of picks. The upside's it's not great, but if he did get thirty minutes, then you might have a double double from him. Now it was a stupid contract, but I still I still like him at this point. Yeah, I can understand that. Like you said, just does enough um, in a few categories that they can they can help you out. And yeah, Kim Noah, um, yeah, don't trust him for season long. But another guy you'd be able to sort of use in and out of your teams. Um, out of position assists are nice if that's what you're after in the rebounds, but the scoring, we've got him projected at not even six and a half points a game, which is just... just It's very not, low. Not, not good, Josh. Not, bad, not, not good. Bad percentages as well. Really bad field goal percentage, really bad... Or, yeah, bad free... Not a good free throw percentage, I'll put it that way. Yeah, great assists, solid blocks, but... And he fits... He'll fit some teams. He'll fit our punt points team pretty well. Um, you absorb his percentages. The assists are nice. The rebounding should be good. The block should be okay. But you you can't put a huge amount of trust in Noah to stay healthy. Yeah. He just he's 31 years of age and he's continually breaking down. He's not the guy that was the defensive player of the year anymore. He's not the guy that was in the top five in MVP voting anymore. It's just if you believe that, then you uh, you, you must work for the Knicks and think that all these guys are going back to their 2011, 2012 form. I just don't see... Look, I could be proved wrong. I don't think I will be, but he's a he's a good late guy, but to expect him to, to return to form of glory, it's a, it's a tough sell for me. Yep, agree. If you're going to ask me about uh, Bismack Biombo, he was the next guy on this list. I'm, I'm not just saying that. He was number 31, so... Yep. Um, he's going to be a popular streaming option as well in standard leagues for the big boost in rebounds um, and blocks. And yeah, if Vucevic does get moved, then um, I'm not going to say it's going to be all over, but that's obviously going to help Biombo's value despite um, a couple of deficiencies that he's got in his game. Um, Tyson there, Chandler. There, there's a it? number of str- okay. there's a number of streaming centers, and yeah, Biombo Chandler. Look, you want some field goal percentage and some rebounds for a week. Chandler's going to help you, but he's not a guy just to hold on to the whole season. Mason Plumley. The minutes are going to be restricted a little bit given the other players that are there. He's another option. Mahinmi is a good stream option. Amir Johnson's a stream option. Zaza Pachulia might be worth looking at. Um, Dwayne Dedman in San Antonio, depending on how they use that front court rotation. Nene will be a guy that for certain stretches during the season you'll have to own him because he'll go and put up four. 14 and 6 in 21 minutes and get a block a game. And you go, you know what, that, that'll help me for this four-game week that Houston's got. But they're not guys to really hold. You know, Miles Plumley, Cock might get some action. Alexia Jinsa appears like he's starting in New Orleans, finally, over Omar Ashik. So maybe Alexia Jinsa can be worth worth a look. Maybe not yet, but it's something to something to watch how they use him. He's He started the first two games, barely played any minutes, but he's in there ahead of Ashik. So... He's another guy. There's going to be a lot of big men to stream. Willie Cauley Stein's another one that you're going to be able to stream in. So don't be too afraid. Mozgov will be available in off waiver wise. Tristan Thompson might be available off some waiver wise. You know, Alex Len could be a, a guy on a waiver wire. Cody Zeller might get undrafted. Heaps of these guys are going to be available on waiver wires very early in the season, I believe. When Mark Gasol misses games, obviously, then you're going to want to use Brendan Wright as well. Well. Apparently, Zach Randolph today, like I said, they had an interview with him after he's been demoted to the bench now to be the backup backup power forward. But they said, are you going to be playing mostly five now? And he said, yeah, I am. I'll, I'll mostly be a five. So 
Wing Souls out, I think you're going to see some Jermichael Green, Zach Randolph front courts, and you're going to have Randolph playing the backup fives a little bit as well, which will be interesting in that sense. That will be very interesting. Um, especially for his uh, elite rim protection. I think that um, I think we might be done with this, Matt. Is that it? I think you might be right. All right, cool. Well, you can go back and check out all of the other positional tier podcasts, videos, and articles up on basketballmonster.com. Obviously, the, the podcast, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, Google Play, and the videos over on YouTube. Go and check out all of those if you want to catch up on all our discussions over the past five weeks regarding these positional tiers. Matt, where can everyone find you on Twitter? You can find me on Twitter at S-Man Sports and um, yeah, have had a lot of viewers, a uh, lot of viewers, a lot of followers jump on. So thanks for the follow and uh, yeah, we're in for, a, in for a very interesting season. Only what, two and a bit weeks away now. Yeah, not, not too far away at all. Just a heads up of what's going to be happening over the next couple of shows. What I'm planning on doing at this point is having a, a Eastern Conference pre-season view so what's I'll probably this will come out Monday most likely so it'll be looking at the Eastern Conference what's happened in the first week and a half of pre-season and then I'll back it up on the next day with the Western Conference what's happened in the first week and a half of pre-season there there'll be some snake mock drafts that will run uh, as well and some more stuff that uh, I'm still working on at the moment to, to come in these next couple of weeks so that's that's the immediate plan for the for the coming podcasts follow Matt on Twitter if you don't already follow me if you don't already at redrock underscore b-ball check out basketball monster if you've got your draft coming up um so many articles over there projections draft tools draft track is awesome check out everything we've got over on the site there as well and uh the rest of the locked on podcast network check out those if you want some specific information on teams i know the locked on lakers guys have got a podcast today talking about the jordan clarkson move to the bench which is pretty dumb to me if you're starting Lou Williams but just they're talking about what it means for Clarkson and if it's going to be a permanent thing or if, if Walton's just you know playing around with things you can check out lots of information with these guys they run like 20 to 30 minute podcasts each day you can get a fair bit of information out of those shows as well for really team specific stuff that you're trying to dive into Matt we're done thank you thank you thank you so much for listening everyone see ya <laughs>